Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and in today's short application exercise, we'll program and test a PLC-based two-wire motor starter. We'll examine the system's behavior in normal operation and its response to emergency stops and overloads. This lecture is predicated on the assumption the viewers watched the commissioning a PLC system featuring the Tico SG2 PLR lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. This aforementioned lecture configured a Tico SG2 PLR, an inexpensive basic PLC, to direct the operation of light industrial, 120 volts line to neutral, 208 volts line to line, 60 hertz, three phase AC primary circuit, configured such that the F contactor energizes a squirrel cage induction motor in the forward direction, and the R contactor energizes a squirrel cage induction motor in the reverse direction. The F and R contactors are mechanically interlocked such that they cannot be simultaneously closed. The PLC has been configured with the following field input and output devices. A normally opened maintain contact selector switch on input 1, a normally closed momentary contact red push button on input 2, a normally open momentary contact green push button on input 3, a normally open momentary contact yellow push button on input 4, the normally open auxiliary F1 contact of the F contactor on input 5, and the normally open R1 auxiliary contact of the R contactor on input 6. The first four field input devices are intended for human-initiated interaction with our system, whereas the auxiliary contacts on inputs 5 and 6 serve as feedback about the status of a particular contactor. Note the maintained contact normally closed e-stop is not a direct input to the PLC, but rather serves as a hardwired bottleneck through which all six field input devices immediately downstream of it must negotiate to issue input to the PLC. Wired in this fashion, the hardwired e-stop effectively severs all incoming communication with the outside world without the necessity of resorting to any programmed instructions to do so. Let's now examine the field output devices. Electromechanical relay output Q1 directs the operation of the F contactor coil hardwired with a normally closed overload contact. Electromechanical relay output Q2 directs the operation of the R contactor coil also hardwired with the same normally closed overload contact. This hardwired connection between the two contactor coils and the normally closed set of overload contacts allows the overload to have the last say as to whether the motor is energized or not and never surrenders complete authority to the PLC. Wired in this fashion, the normally closed overload serves as a means of directly de-energizing either contactor coil in the event of an overload without the necessity of resorting to any programmed instructions to do so. Electromechanical relay output Q3 directs the operation of a red pilot lamp an electromechanical relay output Q4 directs the operation of a green pilot lamp. Again, note the maintained contact normally closed e-stop serves as a hardwired bottleneck through which all field output devices immediately downstream of it must negotiate to be energized. Wired in this fashion, the hardwired e-stop directly above stream of all field output devices effectively severs all outgoing communication from the PLC without the necessity of resorting to any programmed instructions to do so. For the purposes of this exercise, we will not be making use of all field input and output devices. However, this base system is configured as such for other exercises that may need this additional functionality. Given this PLC can be quickly programmed and reprogrammed as we see fit without the time-consuming necessity of physically rewiring it, this and the next several labs making use of this system should be relatively quick and painless. Here's the pared down schematic representing only those field input and output devices and primary elements we'll be making use of today. As you will no doubt recall, a two wire control circuit as implemented using traditional hardwire relay based ladder logic is one that does not maintain or remember the last asserted state because it does not feature a holding circuit. Two wire control circuits commonly make use of automatic inputs like pressure, float, temperature or limit switches and are employed in applications where the unexpected startup of the system does not have the possibility of injuring an operator. If you necessitate review of two and three wire control circuits as implemented using traditional hardwire relay based ladder logic, you are encouraged to revisit the two and three wire control circuits lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. For the purposes of this exercise, we're going to use the normally open maintain contact selector switch on input one as our simulated automatic input. This simulated automatic input could be some normally open pressure, temperature, float, or limit switch that when triggered initiates operation of the motor in the forward direction. Long story short, when the simulated automatic field input device on input 1 closes, the F contactor coil will be energized, the F contactor would close, and the motor would turn on. When the simulated automatic field input device on input 1 opens, 
the F contactor coil is de-energized, the F contactor opens, and the motor turns off. A simple PLC-based two-wire control circuit can be implemented in the following manner. Note rung 1 contains a make construction examining input I1 in series with output Q1. You'll note neither the e-stop nor the normally closed overload make an appearance in the program. However, these devices are readily apparent in the hardwired schematic. Wired in this fashion, the e-stop and normally closed overload serve to override the PLC program in the event of an emergency stop or overload event, though this protection is not without its limits, as we'll demonstrate shortly. Rung 1 alone could demonstrate the behavior of a PLC-based two-wire control circuit. However, since we've got a bunch of input and output devices at our disposal, given this pre-configured system, we may as well put some of them to use. Rung 2 contains a software-generated make instruction examining output Q1 and a break instruction examining input I5, the F1 auxiliary contact in series with output Q3, the red pilot lamp. You'll note this rung has effectively turned the red pilot lamp into a contradiction indicator, meaning that the red pilot lamp will turn on only if output Q1 is being asserted and the F1 auxiliary contact is not closed. As can be expected, one shouldn't anticipate this scenario during normal operation given output Q1 is in fact energizing the F contactor coil. However, there are scenarios, momentary and maintained, that will result in output Q1 being asserted and the F contactor failing to close. Can you predict those scenarios in which such a contradiction might be observed? By all means, pause the lecture and think about this before we place this system in operation and test this program. Here's a quick hint. Think of response time and those hardwired devices that override the program for protection purposes. When the program is downloaded to the target device and placed into operation, we can observe its behavior and simultaneously monitor the program using a live communications link. Note the two videos are synced up, however there's a noticeable lag at the monitoring utility. As can be expected, when the selector switch on input 1 is open, the F contact coil is not energized, then the motor is off. Output Q1 is not asserted, and the F1 auxiliary contact indicates that the F contactor is open and the red pilot lamp is off. When the selector switch on input 1 is closed, the F contactor coil is energized, the F primary contacts close, and the motor turns on. You'll note the red pilot lamp briefly blinks on, indicating there's a fleeting moment of time where output Q1 is asserted and the F contactor hasn't fully closed. Once the F contactor fully closes, the contradiction resolves itself and the red lamp turns off. When the selector switch on input 1 is reopened, the F contactor coil is de-energized, the F primary contacts open, and the motor turns off. The system behaves as anticipated for normal operation. Let's now examine its behavior during emergency stops and overloads. When the selector switch on input 1 is closed, the F contactor coil is energized, the F primary contacts close, and the motor turns on. Again, you'll note the red pilot lamp briefly blinks on, indicating there's a transitory period that output Q1 is being asserted, and the F contactor hasn't fully closed. While in operation, opening the e-stop directly depowers both the field input and output devices without reliance upon any programmed instructions to do so. The F contactor coil is de-energized, the F primary contacts open, and the motor turns off. If input I1 is in the closed position when the e-stop is reset, the F contactor coil is immediately re-energized, the F primary contacts close, and the motor turns on. Let this be a cautionary tale about the limitations of emergency stops in two-wire control circuits. If the two-wire control system is repowered with the automatic input being actuated, the system can spring to life without warning. Let's now examine the system's response to an overload event. As previously, when the selector switch on input 1 is closed, the F contactor coil is energized, the F primary contacts close, and the motor turns on. Again, you'll note the red pilot lamp briefly blinks on, indicating that there's a transitory period that output Q1 is being asserted and the F contactor hasn't fully closed. If during the course of normal operation an overload event occurs, in this case I'm simulating an overload by manually testing it, the open overload directly depowers the affected field output device without reliance upon any programmed instructions to do so. The F contactor coil is de-energized, the F primary contacts open, and the motor turns off. Note, however, output Q1 is still being asserted by virtue of the maintained closure of selector switch on input 1. A potentially deadly situation is coiled and waiting to strike when the overload cools and is manually or automatically reset. Luckily, the logic in rung 2 indicates a contradiction has occurred in that output Q1 is asserted, however the F1 auxiliary contact is not closed. The red lamp is on, indicating that something is amiss. An operator or a technician can take the necessary precautions 
unlock out and tag out the system to investigate the source of the overload. As can be expected, when the overload is reset with the selector switch on input 1 closed, the F contactor coil is immediately re-energized, the F primary contacts close, and the motor turns on. Let this again be a cautionary tale about the limitations of two-wire control circuits. If the system is reset with the automatic input actuated, the system can spring to life without warning. Alright, that's about it for this quick application exercise. In conclusion, we programmed and tested a simple PLC-based two-wire control circuit. We demonstrated its behavior during normal operation and its response to emergency stops and overload events. We learned that the hardwired e-stop and overload can directly override the PLC without resorting to programmed instructions and additionally examine the limitations of two-wire control circuits during emergency stops and overload events. Finally, we included an additional rung on our two-wire control circuit that indicates when the PLC is asserting an output, however, fails to receive confirmation. This indicator demonstrated that there is a transitory period of contradiction accounting for the real-world response time of an electromechanical system that is only continually asserted when some outside event, like an overload, is overriding the PLC program. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.